Hi, welcome to the third installment of the Ask Parse Anything series. This month you have Yuri, Hector, and Fosco to answer your questions. So let's dive in. What is the best way to clear dummy data after running end-to-end -end tests? Okay, so Asha here has a, a separate app that uh, they use for testing parse. And after they run their tests, they're looking for a way to clear out all this data. Well, there's no automated way to do this. We've debated adding such an API before, and maybe we will in the future. Uh, but one way to do this would be to take a look at the open source uh, PHP SDK. Uh, it has a full set of integration tests, and one of the things that it does at the beginning of each section is go in and delete all of the existing objects on parse. So it's manual, but it's, it's relatively simple to go through and delete that in an extra step. For the iOS SDK, are subclasses of subclasses of PF object allowed? It's due to the, they're not. Uh, basically, you can have one subclass uh, for a specific class in your database, uh, and that's due to how we register subclasses. And basically, it's because when we get an object from parse and we need to turn it into a real object, we, we can only turn it into one type, because that's the only way we'd know what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, when I looked into this, it didn't really um, make sense to have more than one, and, and that's, that is what it is. It's a design limitation. Uh, you can't further subclass them and expect that to work. What is the best way to use parse to code common and complex business logic that will be shared among iOS, Android, and Windows phone apps? Yeah, so this is very common uh, when people get started. Um, what I do is I recommend everybody uh, push as much of your logic uh, into cloud functions, like cloud code. So rather than, say you're, you're putting together a query for some set of data. Well, rather than building that query on the client in your iOS app and then building it again in your Android app and building it again in your Windows phone app, um, put all of that query logic into a cloud function that returns the proper results. And then each platform, all they do is call the cloud function, and they get the right results back. So one, it saves you um, rewriting any of that logic for other platforms. And two, it actually allows you to change that logic on the server side without then having to update all of the client apps. I love the new revocable sessions, but I need to create unrestricted sessions from cloud code. How can I do this? OK. Um, so we've done a few things that, that kind of touch on this. Um, there's the um, cloud code OAuth GitHub login uh, project. It basically is a web app that you can do login with GitHub. And so that was recently updated to support revocable sessions. And we also have AnyPhone, which uh, does something similar. Uh, the, the constraint there is that you need the ability to I'm sorry. The, the constraint there is that r unrestricted sessions can only be created through login and sign up. Um, and in order to log in the user, you need to be able to control the password. So depending on what functionality your app does, if the user does not need to know their password because you are creating that login for them in cloud code, if you can overwrite their password and then do a login for them, you can get that unrestricted session token and pass it back to the user. And the user can then use the become met uh, methods to assume that session token. Are there plans to extend the time a cloud function can run? I'm running into the 15 second timeout frequently. Um, so the 15 second thing has been part of uh, cloud code um, since the beginning. And I don't see us rushing to, to extend that. Um, and that's partially due to the release of webhooks. So now with webhooks, you can run your own uh, logic on a different server somewhere and tell us how to reach it. And due to that, you get a longer time limit of at least 30 seconds. So in these cases where you need more time, uh, webhooks is really the answer. What happens when one request modifies and saves one document property, while a concurrent request modifies a different property on the same document? Will both changes be applied to the document? In this case, uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, they would both get applied, because the concurrent requests were both touching different properties. 
if they were both trying to um, change the same property, then whichever one came in last would win. Um, that's like a, a race condition. Um, but yeah, as long as they were performing uh, separate operations, that should be fine. Is it planned to make Android parse object parcelable, or is there a way to pass parse object across activities? Yeah, so there is a plan uh, to implement parcelable on uh, parse object in the Android SDK. Um, can't give a timeline, but it, it is on the horizon. Um, for right now, the best way to do this is to pass the object ID string uh, to your other activity, and then in that activity, refetch the object from parse. Recently, I saw that parse uses Go. What framework or library does parse use for routes? So we write a lot of our, our own Go code here at Parse, uh, including the router that we currently use uh, in our API. Um, so there is some interest, though, in switching to a more community-supported version. Uh, the one that we're kind of looking at is on GitHub. It's under Julian Schmidt, and it's called HTTP Router. Can you please produce a new tutorial on the best way to implement login with Facebook on a Parse-hosted Express web app? with both client and server-side options? Yeah, I, I think we should work on that tutorial. Um, until we have that sort of content up, I would suggest um, looking up the uh, Parse Platform GitHub organization. Um, there you will find uh, uh, the Parse Facebook user session module, which you can import into your Express project as a middleware. And um, that, would let, that will let you uh, work with the Facebook user session on cloud code. I would like to let my users have multiple accounts with the same email address. Why isn't this allowed? Yes, yeah, so um, probably um, Alan is referring to um, the user table has a default field called email. And um, the user table is, uh, enforces uniqueness over this field. So it is not permitted to have more than one user account using the same email address. The reason for this is that um, when you use that field, you're able to use the um, password reset function to let your users regain access to their, ac to their account. Now, if there were multiple users with the same email address, uh, it would be harder to figure out which actual account they want to reset the password for. So that's the main reason why we don't allow it. Um, but if your app is fine with having multiple users having the same email address, then I would encourage you to just create a new email column on your user table. It doesn't have to be named email, just create a new one, and uh, just use that to store the user's email. Is it possible to have two apps share the same Parse app database? I want to send push notifications from one app to the other. Oh, definitely. Yes, yeah, so um, one Parse app um, on the back end, uh, it shares the same database, right? Um, there's nothing preventing you from having multiple client apps talking to the same parse app. This could be anything from um, clients on different platforms, such as an iOS app and an Android app, right? So in the same vein, there's really no difference from having two iOS apps talking to the same parse app. So yeah, just go ahead and use the same set of uh, app ID and client keys on your several apps. Now, when you're sending push notifications to these apps, um, you can use uh, several of the installation fields. Um, there's the um, bundle identifier field, which, which will let you know which specific app uh, is associated with that installation. There's also a device type column that will help you figure out which platform that app is running on. And uh, you can just use this to uh, target your, your push notifications on. Does Parse Cloud Code support all the core Node.js modules? If not, why? Yeah, so um, we actually get this question a lot. And um, something that uh, I want to remind you is that Cloud Code is not a Node environment. Cloud Code is a, it's a V8 environment that we built in-house. For that reason, there's no guarantee that any arbitrary um, node module will work there. That said, we do support um, some of the core modules. Um, if there's anything missing that you would like to implement, um, it is possible to adapt 
a node module to work on cloud code. Um, you, you will need to um, look at the different required calls inside your node module and uh, make sure that they are um, absolute, uh, that they use absolute pass to each file, for example. Um, but yes, that's the main reason why node modules won't just work out of the box. We are a television station group who uses Parse to deliver breaking news push notifications. Recently, we've experienced latency with some pushes, and on your support site, we found you do not consider Parse an immediate delivery system. Is there anything we can do to improve delivery times? That's a great question. So when um, the service that Parse provides for push notifications uh, actually depends on several other services to deliver these messages. Uh, for example, on, uh, on iOS or on iPhone, we use uh, Apple's push notification service. On Android devices, we use uh, Google's cloud messaging service. Um, both of these services uh, are best effort. They don't guarantee immediate delivery. Since we use these services to deliver those push notifications, we cannot ourselves guarantee immediate delivery. Um, that said, on average, most push notifications go out within seconds. When will Parse be available for, Xcode, for the Xcode 7 beta? I can't seem to use it in iOS 9. Yeah, so um, the various uh, iOS betas have been out for a couple of months now, and uh, we've been actually squashing issues as they pop up. Um, the latest iOS SDK should work just fine on uh, Xcode 7 beta 4, which is the uh, current beta as of today. And um, if you still run into any issues, please go ahead and file a bug report and we will take care of it as quickly as we can. Do you support exporting into CSV or Excel formats? So we support exporting into JSON format only. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, the CSV format only allows for a very, li very limited set of data types. For example, uh, numbers and strings. Uh, on the other hand, when you store data on parse, you can store anything from numbers, dates, geo points, files, relations to other, to other tables, and so on. Um, basically, it's not possible to represent this complex structure on a CSV file. For that reason, we provide the export in JSON. Uh, it's a well understood format, it's used widely, um, so we hope that you can take the JSON format and convert it to whatever other format that you may need. We want to add some columns to a 400,000 object table. A background job would take too long to add these columns as the value should be calculated based on other columns. That's, that's a great question, actually. So you can actually do that today. And I would actually suggest that you use a background job. Um, a background job should not take too long to process 400,000 records. For example, if you go to your uh, account settings and bump the request limit for this app up to 600 requests per second, that should allow a background job to process 400,000 records in less than 11 minutes. Um, keep in mind that pricing is based on, uh, it's prorated down to the hour. So if you only set the app to 600 requests per second for that one hour, you won't be charged for a whole month. So that's one way of doing it with a background job. Another way would be to just export the whole collection into JSON format, doing any transformation on the client side, then uploading it again to your class. And of course, I would suggest that you try uh, you test this out on a development version of your app to make sure that the transformation proceeded as expected. Can I specify a custom sound to be played when a device receives a push notification? Hmm. Of course. Um, I think the reason we get this question a lot is because we have a really powerful push composer, and this feature is not part of it. Uh, the reason it's not part of it is because there's some extra work required for it. You need to specify a full JSON payload to send a custom sound, and it's different for iOS and Android. Uh, so you want to check the documentation on a specific platform on how to do it, but it's definitely possible. When can we use Go to write parse cloud code? So technically, you can do that today. While uh, we don't run Go code on parse hosted cloud code, 
Uh, you can do that using the webhooks. Basically, you set up your own server. You write your code in Go or actually any other language. And then you just use webhooks to access data on parse side. Why doesn't PF file support save eventually? Save eventually works really great when you're saving an object. You're just saying, like, save this object eventually, and you don't care when that operation completes. It's going to get to the database. The problem with the file is that first you need to save the file itself, and then you need to get the path of the file and save that. So if you just use save eventually on the PF file itself, you won't know the actual address of the file once it's saved, and you won't be able to save it. So it's not a good idea. How can I use the local data store in iOS to first try from the server and then fall back to the local data store if there was a connection error? So that is actually exactly how you should write the code. You first query against the server, and in the error block, uh, you query against the local data store. Can I use one core table to register users from 10 different apps? The idea is to share the user table with all the apps while registering each one of these apps as a unique app for push targeting. Yes, you can totally do that. And you should host all your apps uh, in the same parse app. And then the push service will just check the bundle identifiers for the push notifications you want to send. And it'll get to the specific apps that you want. I have some old Android phones. They're running the SDK version 8. What is the oldest Android SDK that Parse will support? So yeah, Parse supports uh, Android version 9 and up. And you can see that on the Quick Start Guide of Android. It would be great if you offer a field last modified by for every row, the same way you're already offering created at and updated at. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting feature. Um, for today, you can do it using the before save hook. Uh, basically, check if the request.user is not nil and then update the last modified by field. Um, that's probably the best way to go. Adding collaborators on a project gets very hard. Every time I try and add a collaborator, it doesn't go through. Can you please make it more simple? Yeah, the, the one thing that you want to look after is that the person you're trying to add as a collaborator is an existing Parse user. Uh, if they are, you just add them as a collaborator. If they're not, ask them to create a Parse account and add them as a collaborator. It's as simple as that. Thanks so much for watching the July edition of the Ask Parse Anything series. Visit the link below for a special surprise from the Parse team, and we'll see you next month.